Hey everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News episode. This one is packed with some really cool stories. That's why we decided to film another one so close to the last one. A couple things here. AMD is working with a China-based vendor to work on some new CPUs. They are licensing their Zen architecture for that, so that's big news. Also be talking about Taiwan tech company trade secrets being stolen by their China-based company counterparts. And uh, also DIY soldered CPUs by one Mr. Dare Bauer, the overclocker, trying to solder his own CPU, because I guess if Intel's not going to do it, he wants to try. And also scientific advancements in cooling materials, uh, some GN exclusive leaks about Vega laptops incoming, and more. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Take and the View 71 enclosure. The View 71 is a full tower case that's capable of fitting three video cards in most configurations. It's also one of the better cooling cases in our recent case testing bench lineup. The View 71 has hinged tempered glass doors on either side that make it easy to open and show off. And it comes with at least one rain fan, though you can get the RGB version if you prefer. Learn more at the link in the description below. So the GN news first. First off, we have an overclocking live stream with the 8086K coming up this week. It'll be tomorrow, I think, at the time this video airs. So Wednesday is the day we're doing a live stream. Wednesday, uh, July 11th at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And tune in for that. Basically, going to overclock the 8086K as far as we can. A lot of it will be figured out live because I haven't had a whole lot of hands-on time with it other than to make sure the thing works. So definitely tune in for that stream. It'll be a lot of fun. And then also, uh, we had an issue with this, <laughs> this location almost burning down. So uh, I've got some photos of a breaker panel, and I just wanted to share this because it's, it's, uh, we're very lucky that this did not turn into a bigger issue. But basically, we had some circuits installed for testing. And one of the circuits installed was a 20 amp circuit for power supply testing. You may remember that we got a sun moon power supply tester recently. So that didn't cause any of the issues, but the new circuit put in, the electricians we had come out left, as I understand it, some wires hanging inside of the panel, which caused one of the breakers to jump or bridge to the bus bar. There was a lot of very loud arcing. You could hear it from outside the building even. So uh, the fact that you could hear arcing electricity from 100 feet away through a wall, it tells you how much power was really involved in this scenario. And basically, it almost burned down uh, the house, and so there's scorch marks everywhere as a result of it. In addition to leaving the wire hanging and arcing things, the electricians also installed incompatible breakers with our breaker panel that I obviously wasn't aware of. So that was a problem. Those were the first ones that melted. It was actually a sort of serious event. Firefighters responded. Uh, we were able to keep it controlled. Nothing actually burned down, but it was a close one. So obviously we're very mindful of these things now. This wasn't even caused by us. This was just an electrician not doing their job properly. So $1,600 mistake that hopefully I get refunded for later. We're, we're working on that, but uh, we had to replace the entire panel. So that was a bit of a dilemma. And what I'm getting at is we were taken down for a couple of days there to get new electrical paneling installed and all that stuff. So that was a lot of fun. But uh, just goes to show that there's, uh, I guess, make sure your electricians bring out someone to inspect it is what I'm getting at here. So anyway, that set us back a little bit. Then we have the, the NAS almost dying problem, with, which set us back some more. But we have that all fixed up now, so everything's good to go. And we have a lot going on this week. Live stream is one of them. Specialized thermal paste testing that I'll tell you more about later. 8086K thermal testing, special CPU overclocking features that we won't go into detail yet on, and the Inwin A1 review. So this week will be packed with really good content if you've been uh, looking forward to some more testing based stuff. I know the last week or two were a bit dry on testing, but a lot of that's because of all of the uh, administrative and catastrophic failures that we've uh, had to deal with in terms of the panel and the, the Synology NAS, both of which are now resolved, thankfully. All right, first major news item is the AMD news item about CPUs and licensing the Zen architecture and x86 to a new company in the space. AMD is licensing its Zen architecture to Chinese manufacturer Hygon. The new x86 processor is codenamed Diana and uses AMD's Zen architecture as part of China's Made in China 2025 program, which is part of China's plan to become a global technology capital, not just a manufacturing country. As for x86 licensing, that's the tricky part. Tom's Hardware reports the following, quote, 
As part of the licensing agreement, AMD established a joint venture in China called the Tianjin Huiguan Advanced Technology Investment Co. Limited, or THATIC, I guess is the easier way to say it, and agreed to license its x86 and SOC IP for chip development. THATIC consists of AMD and both public and private Chinese companies, including the Chinese Academy of Sciences that is heavily influenced by the Chinese government. To stay within legal boundaries, HMC licenses its IP to Haigan, which designs the x86 chips, and then sells the design back to HMC. So, quoting Tom's hardware there for that part. The reason that's all very important is because, if you don't know, Intel owns the x86 license, AMD owns the 64-bit license, and they cross-license with each other. So each one can work within those parameters. But uh, to bring a new company into the space for CPU development and get x86 is more or less impossible because you're relying on Intel, who hold the x86 license, to actually grant that license to the new contender in the space. So that's pretty interesting and shows, uh, I don't know, it's, it's a roundabout way for AMD to... I suppose, sub-license to this new company that is based in China. Also, these Diana chips are only intended for the Chinese market, so don't expect to see them outside of China. Next story is very interesting. So this is something published by the Wall Street Journal that we did really encourage you to read. It's about the tech industry, and it's uh, about Taiwan technology companies having some corporate espionage issues with other companies in the space. So the Wall Street Journal published an excellent story about the technology industry trade secrets and the practices of keeping those secret as a whole, including the theft of those trade secrets. So we wanted to bring more attention to the story, not that they need the help, but uh, we'll link it in the show notes below if you want to check it out. The gist of it is this. In 2016, a state-owned Chinese semiconductor manufacturer, Shanghai Huawei Microelectronics Corp, infiltrated Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, which many of you are likely familiar with, TSMC, it is often called in our space. So TSMC makes things like GPUs. They're a silicon manufacturer. They work with NVIDIA, they work with AMD, they work with uh, Bitmain's, become a big customer of theirs. So TSMC had an issue with this company where the uh, state-owned Chinese semiconductor manufacturer was able to illegally access, quote, reams of trade secrets, to quote the Wall Street Journal, and the employee implicated in this corporate espionage was sentenced to a suspended 18-month prison term for IP theft. We can also see moves involving Micron lately, where Chinese courts have suddenly expressed an interest in IP and copyright lawsuits that benefit Chinese competition, particularly state-owned competition, the country is looking to launch its own memory supplier, if you weren't aware of that, and would basically offer competition to SK Hynix, Samsung, and Micron. And of course, none of these three co companies are necessarily innocent of, of doing non-shady things either, but uh, there will be a new vendor potentially joining the space. Recently, a Micron engineer was recruited by UMC, the company that just had a preliminary injunction imposed on Micron in China, and that engineer has been indicted on charges of trade secret theft as he moved from Micron to UMC. Although UMC is a Taiwan-based competitor, the illegally taken documents were used to design chips for Fujian Jinhua Integrated Circuit Company, a Chinese semiconductor company or manufacturer. Nanya is another one that you might be familiar with. This is a smaller DRAM and NAND manufacturer and one of the smallest in the industry. Nanya is responsible for most of the SSD DRAM caching modules that you'll find on M.2 and 2.5 inch SSDs. So if there's DRAM cache, they probably make it. They recently sued one of their engineers or former engineers for supply and manufacturing photographs to Tsinghua Unigroup Limited, which the Wall Street Journal reports is China's largest state-owned chip maker. So according to this write-up by the Wall Street Journal, technology theft has allegedly doubled in the last few years versus 2013. And it's actually, the whole article is a really fascinating read about our industry's intellectual property and trade secret practices, protecting those practices and the corporate espionage. So that's definitely the most interesting part. We'd encourage you to check out the story, check out the show notes below if you need a link for it. But pretty interesting stuff that's very related to our industry and what we can expect over the next few years. The next story moves away from Asia and back to Germany where we have Der Bauer, who recently tried to solder a CPU. So this comes back to something that a lot of you have asked us in the past, which is, well, if Intel's not gonna solder it, and you're replacing the thermal paste with liquid metal, 
why not just solder it while you're at it? And our answer has always, has always been, it's really basically not feasible, at least not for us. Der Bauer had access to a couple of extra tools though and bought some for this. And uh, he worked with a Trinity APU, partly because it was a non-soldered component. It's old, it's not really worth anything. So the chances of screwing up the APU are, are really uh, not high risk. And we'll save the conclusion for his video. If you wanna see the conclusion, go check it out. But to give you an idea, part of what Der Bauer learned is that uh, the process for soldering a CPU is actually obviously pretty complex. And what he did is went and looked at the patent documents by Intel on their soldering process, because those are all public. And he looked at it and tried to use that as a guideline for what he wanted to do, working with a couple of soldering uh, engineering companies in the space to figure out the best solution that was feasible for someone in a not fabrication plant environment to solder a CPU. Some of the things he learned were that you have to coat the backside of the wafer. There has to be a mix of titanium, nickel, and uh, gold, and then a solder sheet and a couple of other materials in there as well. It's just a big stack of materials. He's got a diagram of it in his video. You can't use normal solder because the melting point is too high, which is a big problem that he faced in his attempt to solve this problem. Additional coating of layers on the wafer, including gold, are necessary to protect the CPU and actually make contact with anything. And then he also had to uh, etch the indium oxide layer with hydrochloric acid every hour or so while working on this because it would uh, build up, I suppose, an oxidation layer on the outside of the components he was working with soldering. And also could not get straight indium to just stick to the surface and had to find an alloy of some kind, which I believe used some percentage of silver, maybe 3% silver in there as well with the indium, and ultimately faced an issue with thickness of the layers of solder. This is something we've talked about with our delating practices, where a lot of the performance gain is actually from getting rid of the thickness between the die and the IHS. So you're bringing the IHS down closer to the die and thinning out the thermal interface between it, whether that's solder or something else, it doesn't matter. The idea is the same, which is that the more you reduce the thermal interface between them, the more heat can transfer just straight into the IHS and get out of there, uh, rather than something where you've got gaps and thicker layers that can have some uncharacteristic or, or improper uh, thermal results for what we're going for, which is ultimately to reduce the temperature of the dye, not to increase the temperature of the dye. So go watch Der Bauer's video for the results. I've left them out uh, just because you should watch his video, really. It's very interesting. We, it's worth it. And uh, check out the link below if you want to see that one. Next one is scientific advancements in cooling materials that were put out this week. So Science Journal recently published a research paper detailing efforts to create a highly thermally conductive semiconductor that can be worked with as a replacement to silicon. So it's electrically similar to silicon, but with higher thermal conductivity. The researchers stated that thermal conductivity of their non-toxic boron arsenide solution is now reaching 1000 watts per meter Kelvin. For comparison, copper would be at around 405 watts per meter Kelvin at 25 degrees Celsius, with aluminum at around 200 watts per meter Kelvin. Silicon's thermal conductivity tends to be around 150 watts per meter Kelvin, and that ranks the boron arsenide material as about seven times more thermally conductive than traditional silicon. This would allow heat to exit the silicon faster and spread across the surface area faster and then into the attached cooling devices. We're currently unclear on if this boron arsenide solution will be able to replace silicon components and things we're used to working with, or if it's more of a specialized component for the future. For example, in highly thermally sensitive scenarios like in a spaceship or an Intel i9 CPU, for example, they're about the same really, it might be a future engineering avenue and something to pay attention to, but this is still in the research paper phase and they have actually been designing and working with the material, but we're not anywhere close to any kind of mass production or adoption just yet. So the next one is about Vega laptops incoming. This is a note that we received. So Gamers Nexus received information from close to AMD that Vega mobile devices are on the way at this point. And the first one, from what we understand, is basically a cut down Vega GPU from the GPU architecture on desktop that we already know. So architecturally won't be all that different from Vega 56 or 64. However, it's going down to 1792 stream processors, typically 
you just multiply by 64. So 56 times 64, 64 times 64 is 4096. So you'd have 4096 stream processors on Vega 64. Uh, 1792 is the cut down version. And it's going to have at least four gigabytes of HBM2. And it will be using 14 nanometer process. So far, not a whole lot of changes. Clocks will likely be in the range of 1100 to 1350 megahertz, depending on the thermal scenario and final engineering decisions that we might not be privy to right now. Overclocks are also supposed to be at least unlocked on some devices from what we understand. And our sources have further informed us that it's essentially, again, a cut down Vega architecture GPU just in a laptop. So uh, there is some debate potentially going on of if there's going to be a higher capacity solution in terms of memory, then four gigabytes could be eight. It'd be a bit odd to do six, but certainly possible just because at that point you're doing two stacks anyway, so you might as well go with eight. Uh, but we're unclear on what the final choice was there. So anyway, coming to the laptops soon, TM, not clear on when, but it might be towards the end of the year would make, make the most sense based on AMD's other announcements. Next up, workstation performance GPU testing. Our friends over at TechGage just published a detailed benchmark of workstation performance with different GPUs. This is something we don't get too far into on our side of testing, but we wanted to highlight Rob Williams' work on benchmarking high-end GPUs for non-gaming workloads. The testing included 3ds Max 2019 rendering, where the Titan XPs managed to outperform the 1080 Ti and Quadros, and also Blender, where the AMD RX Vega 64 card excelled to a point of only being outperformed by dual Titan XP cards. TechGage has also tested Vegas and other software, not to be confused with Vegas, but Vegas, the editing software. Find the rest of their tests at the link in our show notes or go to techgage.com and look for their workstation GPU test. We previously reported on Arctic Cooling's plans to bring completely passive coolers to market. The company has finally launched its coolers named the Alpine 12 series and aims to offer them at around $15. The coolers have pre-applied MX2 compound, no fans included, as is the nature of passive cooling, and use a simple aluminum fin stack atop the socket. These aren't rated for much. They can take about 47 watts TDP, depending on how you measure it, and will work with both AM4 and low-end Intel 11.5X components and socket types. Finally, hardware sales for the week, Cooler Master's original H500P. Yes, that one, the one that fell apart and then later has been significantly improved. That case, is on sale for about 110 bucks, but it includes a $30 rebate if you count those. Not everyone does, which is fair. And if you do count it, it brings it down to about 80 bucks. So the case still has every single problem that we didn't like about it originally. They're trying to clear the channel because as those go out of stock, the stuff with the changes that fixed all the problems we had and everyone else had will come into stock. So they're clearly trying to clear stock. That said, if you're willing to put about half an hour of work into it and find mesh somewhere, you could do the mesh mod that we did, and you'll basically have an H500P mesh, which is actually a case we highly recommend for 80 bucks plus the cost of 30 minutes of your time and a filter. So uh, we would not recommend it as a standalone purchase, but if you are okay with modding or think it might be a fun project, it would be worthwhile at that price just because it is actually a pretty good deal and you can come in under the H500P mesh still and come out ahead. Corsair's Vengeance LPX memory is also sort of on sale as much as memory can be these days. That is available in 16 gigabyte two by eight capacities at 3000 megahertz for around 176, which is likely marked down in part due to its green PCB, uh, which I'm sure Corsair is ashamed of now that they've stuck RGB and black PCBs on every single thing that they make. So that's on sale, sort of. And then EVGA's new 750 PQ Supernova power supplies, uh, the platinum certified ones that just came out, are sort of marked down as well for about 14% off on Newegg. But anyway, links below for those if you're interested in any of them. As always, show notes and the links in the description below if you want to check out the sources for any of this stuff. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick up one of our blueprint shirts that we just restocked, except you've also already bought a lot of them, but thank you for the support. And go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to join our Patreon Discord. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.